Is it really a surprise that a film directed by one of the greatest fashion designers alive looks incredible? I mean, even if we forget about the costumes, which weren't even Tom Ford by the way, the production design, locations, lighting, all work so incredibly well to bring his story to life. Well, three stories. And the person we have to thank for that is Seamus McGarvey. I hope I pronounced that correctly. In today's video, I'm going to be covering the equipment McGarvey used how he crafted the look, as well as his use of lighting, because it really helps tell each of the stories. A single man was shot on film, and both Tom and the producers had already made the decision to shoot nocturnal animals on film too. In fact, for the film within the film, it was essential to shoot on film. It was almost a given that nocturnal animals was going to be shot on film, and even though McGarvey did consider shooting certain aspects on large format digital, ultimately, due to the scheduling, they ended up shooting everything on the Panavision Panaflex Millennium XL2 paired with their Primo lenses. Now, the XL2 is basically the gold standard for 35mm film cameras. They're lightweight, have the ability to easily sync sound, is compatible with all of Panavision's film lenses, both anamorphic and spherical, and has the ability to hold both 400 and 1000 foot magazines. As for the Primos, these are just perfect for when you want a high quality set of lenses, as not only do they have high contrast, resolution, minimal distortions, but they also come in a range of focal lengths that can be opened up pretty widely, which is one of the reasons why McGarvey went with the spherical versions over the anamorphics. So with all of that in mind, we shot spherical 2.35 to 1 with Panvision Primo Primes for the most of the show, and with a couple of Primo zooms, the 19 to 90 mm and 24 to 275 mm for the highway car chase sequence. As for the stocks, McGarvey kept it simple with Kodak Vision 3 200T and 500T, as since they were shooting the majority of the film at night, he wanted the fastest stock he could get. Unlike digital, with nighttime photography on film, you have complete control of the light. You paint the negative out of a black canvas in an additive, artistic process. As with all of the films I analyse, I'm finding it hard to put the look of the film into words, as there are aspects that feel clinical, yet they are true to that location. The overall feeling of the film is pretty raw though, but it's clearly been stylized to help further the story, and as for the colours, they feel exaggerated. This isn't what we would see in real life, but it doesn't seem far from reality. So I think again, I'm going to go with the phrase heightened realism. Now, whilst this was shot on tungsten stocks, we can see a very stark difference between real life and the novel, the former being much cooler than the latter. However, it goes much deeper than that, as the actual colors in the shot, for example, the sofa, the walls, these can all help portray a certain emotion more than a grade can. For example, the scene in the cabin, Whilst it's a bit of a dirtier palette, it's still pretty true to life, and apart from the fact that we can tell that this isn't a very nice place due to the lighting and the walls, we also get the impression of danger from the red curtains to his left. Overall, the colours are very rich. This isn't some muted or restrained palette. There are some very particular choices, however, and that leads me to the fact that in each of these stories, the present day one, the novel, and the past life, have very defined looks, and this is not only down to the colour, but also the composition and the lighting. So to look at the composition, the present day scenes have a lot of frames within frames, something McGarvey was doing to almost portray that she is inside her own psychological horror film. Now, her present day compositions are also the most unique, and as the movement is quite restrained in these scenes, it's a way to evoke emotion. For example, having a lot or having minimal breathing room, there seems to be more negative space around her, and whilst this could be down to the more modern location, it also just draws focus onto her. Susan's world is very spare, controlled and metric, a brittle symphony of black, grey and dark brown, and we kept the camera pretty static. When she reads the script, we played with close-ups and a Hitchcockian style of shots looking down from a higher perspective to bring in a sense of suspense. For the novel, McGurvey looks towards classical westerns for that epic and vibrant feel, and we definitely see that. The expansive shots with these stunning sunsets, deep contrast and almost gloomy lighting, which is even there in the middle of the day, and of course depth to the background. When it comes to the movement however, it's much more erratic than before, and as McGurvey puts it, there's an unstable urgency in the framing, 
and paired with the already volatile circumstances, this really helps show the gravity of the situation. Obviously, utilizing handheld helps with this as it's a way to add uncertainty to the movement. And as for her flashback scenes, Mugovi went after the French New Wave look, which focuses on more playful tones of colour, movement and composition, which in a film like this is almost necessary. Now this is a long quote, but it gives a lot more context to some of the creative references that Mugovi and Ford used on the film. For the LA scenes, we considered the stasis and sparseness of Bernardo Bertolucci's The Conformist. To bring in an element of the noir genre, we looked at Night of the Hunter and The Kill-Off, which you might call deep American colour noir. We also liked the supernatural lighting and shadow in the paintings of Victorian artist Henry Fuseli. For the desert scenes, we looked at how the landscape and characters were handled in masterpiece westerns such as The Searchers, and you can never rule out the influence of the great Alfred Hitchcock for interesting, spooky camera positions. Overall, this is quite a dark film. I mean, even when we are in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the day, it's still rather dim. And whilst yes, it does reflect on the story, it's also quite an interesting choice to make, as the average audience seems to just be getting more and more turned away by darker films. However, like I said, it reflects on the story, and at the end of the day, that's all that really matters. As I mentioned earlier, there are three quite defined looks for each of the stories, and that's also portrayed in the lighting. Starting with the present day, the lighting is quite pronounced, especially in the close-ups. Now, this is used in the novel story as well, but here it creates a sense of intensity in the character. Apart from reading the book, there isn't much going on in this storyline, so McGurvey needed to find a way to portray an emotion without needlessly moving the camera. I will also note that the opening credits also uses quite pronounced lighting, however I can't show much of that here. To look at the lighting in the novel however, there is quite a stark difference. It's much more low key, shadows feel more prevalent, the lighting, whilst in parts is very stylized, feels more raw and true to what's actually happening, and it's just what I imagine when I think of a thriller movie. Now, the use of low-key lighting really helps enhance performance as it lets the cinematographer draw focus to the actor without disrupting the surrounding area, and whilst you can do this through composition, sometimes it's just more effective to do it this way. So finally, to touch on the past life, these scenes feel much more vibrant in comparison to the other two parts, and the lighting feels very French New Wave, which is exactly what McGurvey was after. So overall, Ford and McGurvey have created this very aesthetically pleasing style that still manages to tell a story. McGurvey used movements to his advantage by only utilising it in scenes where it would have had the most impact, and adopted lighting techniques that allowed him to evoke emotion without moving the camera. Now, I don't know about you, but I hope we see this duo again very, very soon. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, not if you did, if you have a recommendation for an analysis, leave it down below. Thank you so much for watching, and maybe I'll see you next time. Bye!